post war, Germany's greatest fear was a war on two fronts. It just turns out the French were experts in orchestrating such tactics to deal with the Holy Roman Empire, usually led by the Austrian Habsburgs. They would ally with the Hungarians, Russians and even despite how much it would anger the rest of the Catholic world, the Ottomans. On the other side, to counterweigh Britain, they would ally with America, always putting them in the spot where they can sandwich their enemies in. But no such power had come to their aid in the Franco-Prussian War of 1870. Their attempts to ally with Italy and Austria failed, and so France was defeated, forced into surrendering Alsace-Lorraine to the new German Empire. This would further result in the abdication of the monarch Napoleon III, creating the Third French Republic. Many in France became resentful towards the Germans and wished for revenge. However, these dreams of reconquest seemed so far out of the range of possibility at the time that many politicians in France believed the nation should forget move on and maybe try and heal relations with the Germans. This they did try, France saw British Egypt as rightfully theirs and talks of a secret plan began to take place. This could have resulted in a French invasion of Britain. France planned an anti-British coalition of themselves, Germany, Spain, Italy and Russia. Talk emerged of an invasion of Britain itself, Egypt and even Burma, supported by a Russian invasion of India. Despite this alliance offer, the Germans seemed unwilling to take part and the deal was broken off altogether once the Germans named their price. They wanted Alsace-Lorraine to be accepted as German and the French to back down from any claim over it. This was deemed unacceptable, showing where the French really stood in their geopolitical position. Meanwhile, many French monarchists wanted an alliance with Russia, whereas the Republicans saw the empire as backwards and untrustworthy, still continuing old, outdated, autocratic policies. But France needed an ally in the East to counterweigh Germany. Russia, on the other hand, after many attempts, seemed incompatible for an alliance with Germany or Austria-Hungary. They needed an ally, likewise, to throw off the growing Central European threat. Russia also needed money to fund their industrialization. German banks were forbidden from investing into Russia. Despite French setbacks, however, they were still a wealthy power and had the money to offer. France could ally Russia and please the monarchists with it, but through funding Russian development could perhaps modernise the nation and bring the republicans on board as well. In addition, the Pope pushed for such an alliance to take place to counter the anti-Catholicism that existed in Germany. It seemed everything fit perfectly and so the Franco-Russian alliance was born. France, through the same method, built deep relations with Serbia. Many Serbian kings and diplomats studied in French universities, building early relations. But most importantly, the Serbian people liked France due to their heavy investment into railways and schools. Colonially, France had many ambitions, but most of these were against Britain. Their real threat, however, was on the continent. Germany, and so they were forced to be lenient to the British in the hope that Britain would come to their aid if a major war was to break out. They still had disputes, of course, but ultimately progress was made, and the two former rivals came to several agreements during this period, such as a joint effort at constructing the Suez Canal starting in 1885 and the Anglo-French Convention of 1882 which resolved the territorial disputes in Western Africa and the Entente Cordiale of 1904. 
Franco-British relations had come a long way since medieval times. They were still rivals, and arguably still are, but it became limited to more of a colonial rivalry. After the scramble for Africa, most of those borders had been agreed upon, and so maybe it was time for these two great powers to set their differences aside they perhaps thought. An outcome of a scramble for Africa that Bismarck probably never saw coming. But that was not the only reason. Britain was allied to Japan, and France to Russia by this point. The Russo-Japanese War had begun. The Entente Cordiale Agreement was partly to ensure that both won't be called in to help in this war, as such an event would only really weaken them both over something that was borderline pointless to their aims. The agreement was mostly a colonial one. Britain accepted French rights over Morocco and France over British rights in Egypt. However, France maintained their guarantee of free passage through the Suez Canal. It was agreed the French Morocco and British Gibraltar could not build defensive structures along the coast, ensuring that ships can always sail through, and much more smaller little details. Fun fact, an anti-German alliance between the two was being discussed as far back as 1881, but fell apart due to the Berlin Conference, where Africa was divided among the European powers, so maybe Bismarck did see it coming and just used it to stall for time. However, this was not a full alliance like what France had with Russia. Britain wanted to make that clear. If France was attacked by Germany, Britain would not be legally obliged to come to France's aid. The Triple Entente was the merging of the three agreements already discussed, so that the three powers could work together in peace and friendship, but it meant next to nothing and was just words. So there's the thing, it never was the Triple Entente versus the Triple Alliance. I say this as if it is a big revelation, mostly because of how it is taught. It was the Triple Alliance versus Serbia and the Franco-Russian Alliance. Britain was not contractually obligated to join the war for France or Russia's sake, unlike how it is taught at least here in schools. German victory relied on the Schlieffen Plan. Take out France as Russia will be slow to mobilise, and then go for Russia. But as Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia, this led to the start of Russian mobilisation, but no declaration of war. Germany knew that if a big war was to trigger, and Russia had a head start in mobilisation, their entire survival plan would have been impossible. Germany declared war on Russia, but again, the Schlieffen plan relied on them taking out France first. France, legally, had to come to Russia's aid by this point, but still no news from France. Out of pressure and desperation, Germany declared war on France and Belgium, initiating the war they believed inevitable. Britain did not legally have to join, however they did guarantee the independence of Belgium. Britain joined out of the defence of Belgium, not out of France, but more than that on next week's video. Overall, many historians argue that the big triple entente was actually not important at all. Although it must be added that the Triple Entente did become a real alliance in 1914, once the war had already started. This included the agreement that all three powers must share a spot at the peace table and agree on the terms between themselves. Before we end, it's time to run through the thought experiment yet again, to get an understanding of French war aims. Let us say the Schlieffen plan is underway, but the French government caught on to it quick, ultimately surrounding and wiping out a large proportion of the German army. Through their access with Belgium, they create the same scenario and forced the surrender of Germany. Meanwhile, a French naval invasion is led from North Africa, taking troops to Montenegro, where they ruthlessly obliterate their way through the poorly equipped Austro-Hungarian lines. 
Finally, the Ottoman Empire joins the war, and France has incredible success against them, and seizes Istanbul through their own successful version of the Gallipoli Campaign. Of course, this would never happen, but now, with such a dominant France, what would the French government demand for themselves? Let's start with the Ottoman Empire, as we know what they wanted from the Constantinople Agreements, signed early into the war. The French government wanted the Syria and Cilicia regions, which historically they did take in our timeline, although it would later lose Cilicia. In this timeline, I think we would also have likely seen France push for the Ottoman Empire to become a republic, much like themselves. As for Austria-Hungary, I certainly imagine them ensuring Serbia receives their rewards, as Serbia was heavily indebted to France. Given the unstable position the Empire would be in, in such a scenario, I think France may divide them into smaller republics, like we saw historically. Not for France's own gain, but for the region's own good. Lastly, Germany. This is a tricky one. In our timeline, we know that France wished to seriously break down Germany, weakening them to the point where they will never pose a threat again. However, this attitude came later into the war. A different world, a different death toll, a different France. This thought experiment is about looking at their plans going into the war, so 1914. Therefore, I see the result of such a conflict being more of a counter to what Germany had proposed upon them after the Franco-Prussian War. Germany would, of course, have to return Alsace-Lorraine back to France. In addition, the rich coal fields of the Saar region were historically given to France for 15 years. With such a dominant France, I believe this would be changed to forever. However, with both of these territorial changes, the people would have been granted a choice. Stay in the new France or emigrate back to Germany, as the Germans also allowed the people of Alsace-Lorraine to do that after the Franco-Prussian War. And of course, war reparations, but nowhere near as harsh as they were in our timeline. And maybe France might get a few colonies out of the deal too. This arrangement would match their previous defeat. However, I believe France would also push for a return of the land taken from Denmark, and perhaps the independence of Poland, given France's past history with the nation. This would work well with their dividing of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, however the Russians would not have been too happy about this. This in a way could create another Serbia, a nation with a lot of land still under the occupation of another power. Therefore, to avoid future conflict with Russia, France may propose the entire nation be made independent, but reliant on Russia as a compromise to the Russian Empire. In our timeline, the French talked of granting the Rhineland semi-independence as a French puppet and a buffer state to hold back the Germans in any future conflict, but I believe that and other concessions in our timeline would not have been considered in 1914, as those were more of a result of that anger over the severe amount of losses built up as the war dragged on. Anyway, hope you enjoyed and learnt something. Leave a like if you did, and subscribe to get notified of next week's video, where we will be going over Britain. Please share with anyone you think may be interested, it really helps me out. This has been the history of diplomacy.